Since its creation as a singular entity way back in 1987, Final Fantasy has grown to become an absolute beast of a franchise, and due to the sheer volume of associated games that have released since, it was even awarded the Guinness World Record for being the most prolific role-playing franchise, which Yosuke Matsuda collected during Frankfurt's Final Fantasy XIV Fan Festival last year. As part of this expansion, we have of course seen numerous numbered titles created, with sequels to those numbered titles now becoming a much more permanent fixture within the roster of Final Fantasy games. But we've also seen an absolute boatload of spin-offs created over the years too, the first of which actually arrived only a few years after the original Final Fantasy game released. It was called Seiken Densetsu Final Fantasy Gaiden in Japan and Final Fantasy Adventure in the West, and it went on to spawn the Seiken Densetsu franchise, also known as Mana. Now many of these spin-offs have actually been successful enough, like Final Fantasy Adventure was, to launch their own sub-franchises within the Final Fantasy brand. And some of these sub-franchises have even been successful enough to see the creation of further offshoots, some of which have even become franchises of their own, which would make them sub-sub-franchises. An example of this would be Crystal Guardians, which was followed up by Crystal Defenders and Crystal Defenders Vanguard Storm. It sounds pretty unique, right? But it's actually a spin-off from Final Fantasy Tactics A2, which is of course a sequel to Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, which is in itself a spin-off from Final Fantasy Tactics, and is part of the wider Ivalice Alliance. Either way, with there being such a breadth of games out there for you to try, we figured it would be a great idea to let you know which ones we feel are the best of the bunch. Just as a disclaimer though, throughout this video we won't be including direct numbered sequels like Final Fantasy X-2 or Final Fantasy XIII-2, we will not be including spiritual successors like Bravely Default, and there will most certainly not be any games like Kingdom Hearts or Urgies where Final Fantasy characters simply appeared in cameo roles and aren't the main basis for the game happening in the first place. Alright, so with that out of the way, my name is Daryl, and here are our picks for the top 7 Final Fantasy spin-offs, starting with Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles. Following on from the absolutely huge feud that had developed between Square and Nintendo after the release of Final Fantasy VII on the original PlayStation, the franchise skipped out on the N64 entirely. But as relations started to become a little bit less frosty, it was decided that a spin-off title would be a good way of easing Final Fantasy back onto Nintendo systems, and that spin-off ended up being called Crystal Chronicles. It was directed by Kazuhiko Aoki, one of the old guard at Square. Aoki had actually joined the company way back in 1984, and amongst other things, he worked alongside Hiroyuki Ito to oversee the creation of the famed ATB system, and he also directed a small game called Chrono Trigger. For its time, Crystal Chronicles was actually incredibly innovative. By using the Game Boy Advance link cable functionality, you could hook up four Game Boy Advances that would then act as controllers for the game. The beauty of this was that you'd gain access to an additional screen, which would display something unique and useful to your party to aid in the group's progression, while also giving you a secret, customised objective that you needed to personally accomplish during dungeons in order to get the best spoils at the end. Now, I will admit, the single player experience in Crystal Chronicles was a little dry, but let's face it, it was all about the local cooperative play with a group of your mates. When you throw in the awesome music by Kumi Tanyoku, the immensely exciting cow racing at the Fields of Fom, and the pretty decent story, you've got the makings of a winner. And if you're able to try and replicate that original experience as you just happen to have a GameCube, four Game Boy Advances, four Game Boy Advance link cables, and of course, three mates to play with, then you will have an absolute blast. Okay, so next on our list is Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII, a title that would be born from humble beginnings but would ultimately end up becoming one of the best games on the PlayStation Portable from the perspective of both literal sales but also praise from critics and fans. With the compilation of Final Fantasy VII continuing to expand following the releases of Advent Children and Before Crisis, Hajime Tabata pitched to Yoshinori Kataze and Tetsu Nomura the concept of the compilation expanding to the PlayStation Portable. They agreed, and following some internal discussions, it was agreed that Zack Fair, a somewhat minor character from the original game, 
would be the main character as Nomura and Kazushige Nojima had actually already expanded his backstory when they were working on the original game, it just didn't get included. Kitaze also tasked Tabala with making sure that Crisis Core acted as a game that would connect all of the other compilation properties that had previously been released. It was a rather tall order, but I think it's safe to say that those goals were accomplished. Crisis Core was able to smoothly slot into the wider lore of Final Fantasy VII, introducing new characters like Angeal and Genesis, while fleshing out the backstory of famed characters like Cloud, Sephiroth and Aerith. Due to its success, it also helped to drive a new influx of players to the franchise, and it meant people got to experience the story of Final Fantasy VII from two completely different perspectives. I personally have fond memories of playing Crisis Core on the train, although it usually wasn't a good idea as I'd often get absorbed and forget that I actually needed to get off the train. You also probably don't want to experience the ending of Crisis Core in a public place, as it's one of the saddest endings in video games. And if you don't believe me, well at least the Japanese public do, as they voted it the second saddest ending, placing it behind Final Fantasy X. Our next game though, could also give both Crisis Core and Final Fantasy X a run for their money with regards to sad endings, and that is Final Fantasy Type-0. This game was announced alongside Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy Vs XIII way back during E3 2016 as Final Fantasy Agato XIII, but it ended up releasing under a different name with a different premise and a different storyline. And part of this is because development was somewhat sandwiched around Crisis Core, and even once that shipped, Hajime Tabata's team then moved on to focusing on the third birthday before then finally being able to focus on Type-0. It meant fans had a very long time to get excited about the game, and when it released in Japan to rave reviews and strong sales, the hype was pretty real amongst Western audiences. They just wanted to play this new, great Final Fantasy title. But Square Enix refused to release it in the West because of worries around piracy and the lack of sales potential. We had to wait almost four years until it was localised, and it ended up being a rather interesting situation, as Square Enix chose to port a game that was originally developed for the PSP to the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. It was therefore a bit shoddy in certain areas compared to other current generation titles, but the core of the game was still very strong, and despite having a rather expansive cast of characters, the storytelling was bold and well executed. Never before have we seen such an aggressive Final Fantasy game, and the ending, ah, oh, that hit hard. It was a game that really put Hajime Tabata on the map for me as a director, as I just appreciated the fearless approach he had to the game's development. He wasn't opposed to taking risks and breaking away from the norm, and that's exactly what I wanted to see. Our next game is Dissidia Duodecim, which also arrived on the PlayStation Portable. So if you didn't own that specific console, you unfortunately missed out on some pretty great Final Fantasy experiences. Duodecim arrived a few years after the release of Dissidia Final Fantasy, a fighting game that brought all the numbered games together under one banner to help celebrate the 20th anniversary of the franchise. And despite the original Dissidia being planned to be a standalone game, following its commercial success, the team pressed forward with plans for a new iteration which they would use to implement a lot of the elements that they just didn't have time to include in the original game. It would see the roster expanded based on that original single protagonist criteria to include characters like Varn, Lightning and Prish from newer titles, but it would also be expanded further by introducing additional representatives from each numbered title. It meant that characters like Tifa Lockhart, Kane Highwind and Yuna were now added to the fray and they helped to make the gameplay much more diverse. We also got an expanded story, new gameplay mechanics and they even chose to include the entire story from the original Dissidia, making it a rather complete package. It all meant that in my opinion, Joy Deesum served as a much more fitting tribute to the Final Fantasy franchise than the original game had, as it blended the action style gameplay that fans had longed for with a much more expansive roster of characters and a cohesive narrative. You could say that Joy Deesum acted as the Enix to the Final Fantasy franchise that allowed fans to square their favourite characters off against each other. And even with Dissidia NT releasing not too long ago, I'd say that Duodecim still stands as the best entry in this particular sub-franchise.
Moving away finally from the PlayStation Portable, our next spin-off, World of Final Fantasy, arrived less than two years ago on the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation Vita. However, it was an unfortunate victim of circumstance and ended up being somewhat overshadowed by a game with probably the biggest marketing push in Square Enix's history, Final Fantasy XV. World of Final Fantasy served as the directorial debut for Hiroki Chiba, someone who has had a major influence on Final Fantasy for many, many years, having been involved with crafting narratives for Final Fantasy 7, 8 and 10, as well as Dirge of Cerberus, Lightning Returns and Type-0, and it really shows with the game that he created. In my review, not too long after its release, I called World of Final Fantasy a love letter to fans of the franchise, and after watching Lauren play through the game again recently, I would definitely stick to that original assertion. Chiba used traditional Final Fantasy characters and locations to great effect, as they enriched Grimoire, the original world that they had created for World of Final Fantasy, and they were also used to complement the original narrative that focused around Rain and Lan. But he didn't just stop there. Humour was used in very appropriate ways, and Chiba paid the right amount of tribute to older works without taking things too far. For example, a modified ATB system was chosen for the gameplay, but they modernised it by adding in features like fast forward and the brand new stacking mechanic. And the good thing is that despite it launching in Final Fantasy XV's shadow, World of Final Fantasy did well enough for them to take things further. At the end of last year they announced a mobile spin-off called World of Final Fantasy Melly Mello and they even hinted that there may be more on the horizon. Next on our list is Theatrhythm Final Fantasy Curtain Call. It acted as the second game released in the Theatrhythm sub-franchise which was originally created to scratch a rather big itch within the franchise. Ichiro Hazama actually came up with a concept for a Final Fantasy music rhythm game while working on Advent Children. It means it took almost a decade for this concept to be realised, and he said it was due to technical limitations. And when Curtain Call released two years after the original Theatrhythm, it really took things to the next level. There were 221 songs in the base game, which was approximately four times more than the original game, and a further 100 songs were made available for purchase on the Nintendo eShop. But one of the biggest additions to Curtain Call was that of Versus Mode. It helped Theatrhythm go beyond just being a personal experience that helped gamers to reminisce and enabled them to share that experience with others. And this is something that we've seen firsthand, as whenever we've held meetups in London, there have always been plenty of people who have wanted to take part in our Theatrhythm tournaments. We have since seen a third Theatrhythm game released called All Star Carnival, but this was only exclusive to arcades. For now though, Curtain Call is still a great game to check out if you haven't had the opportunity to do so. Okay, so last but very much not least on this list is of course Final Fantasy Tactics. It was the brainchild of Yasumi Matsuno who had been creating quite a name for himself due to the success of the Ogre games that he had been working on while at Quest. Taking classic Final Fantasy elements such as the job system and summons, Matsuno went about adapting his previous works to create something unique that would be completely different from Final Fantasy games that had come before, but would still be recognisable as being part of the franchise. The result was Final Fantasy Tactics, a strategy RPG that utilised an isometric battle landscape where characters could move and perform actions within a turn-based framework. In addition to this rather unique twist on the gameplay, Matsuno also crafted an incredibly intricate overarching world called Evilies. This would go on to spawn an entire franchise of its own, and the story of tactics that focused on Ramza and Delita just couldn't help but draw people in. It all adds up to make Final Fantasy Tactics the definitive spin-off game in the franchise, and if you want to check it out, the best place would again be the PlayStation Portable, where the Definitive Edition was released as Final Fantasy Tactics The War of the Lions. So yeah, those were our picks for the top 7 Final Fantasy spin-off games. How do you feel about them? Are there any you feel we've missed out? As always, let us know in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. And if you'd like to become a Patreon supporter to help this channel grow, please head over to patreon.com forward slash ffunion. You are a mighty wall of supporters before you. If you pledge even on the lowest tier, you will get your name featured here alongside these legendary souls and get access to our awesome giveaways. Alright guys, that's enough from me. This is Daryl signing out. I will see you next time for more Final Fantasy videos.